career in healthcare. Let me ask you a second question. If three jumbo jets crashed every day, killing everybody on board, would you get on an airplane? Unfortunately, by some accounts, medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States, taking anywhere from a quarter to half a million lives every year. That's the equivalent of two to three jumbo jet crashes every day. I come from a 32-year career in aerospace. If we had three jumbo jet crashes every day, we'd be grounding whole fleets of airplanes. Yet somehow in the medical field, it seems to be business as usual. These errors not only result in death and morbidity, but also result in a large economic burden. A Milliman report estimates that medical errors cost the United States $19.5 billion in 2008. And if you consider quality-adjusted life years, the true burden is closer to $1 trillion every year. Diagnosis-related events are the largest cause and the largest amount of paid medical liability claims. A recently published recovery report of an analysis of 10,500 claims paid between the years of 2013 and 2017 shows one-third are related to diagnosis and account for almost half of all indemnities paid. Of the diagnostic errors claims paid, 60% involve some type of procedure by radiology or radiologists. And perhaps most disturbing to many in this audience are that by the age of 60, half of you will be involved in a suit. We need to eliminate medical diagnostic errors. They kill people and they cost a lot of money. Now, to make an impact on medical diagnostic errors, first we have to know what they are. Fortunately, the Institute of Medicine provides us a clear and succinct definition. Medical diagnosis errors are the failure to establish an accurate and timely explanation of the patient's health problems or the failure to communicate that explanation to the patient. The report goes on to recommend that healthcare professionals should partner with patients and families in their diagnostic process. We all know that getting to the right diagnosis and treatment are key to rapid and quick recovery. And radiology is at the forefront of screening, diagnosis, and treatment, imaging to find the problem and to monitor uh, response to treatment, and intervention to biopsy and to deliver treatment. Despite radiologists not often reacting face-to-face -face with patients, they are often involved in the full continuum of care for many patients. At this point, I suspect many of you, especially the radiologists in the audience, are wondering, why is she talking about this? I don't pick the test, and I don't talk to patients. But can you talk to patients? Is there a better way of doing this? How do we partner with patients and their families and make them part of their care team? Actually, you do help select the right test, and you do talk to patients. Up until now, many of you do this through a proxy, the referring physician. They basically pick the right test using some kind of guidelines, such as the American College of Radiology appropriateness criteria, and you rely on the referring physician to relay the test results to the patient. In fact, similar to my experience, many of you may not be allowed to talk to the patient. But in this game of telephone, the stakes are a lot higher than just giggles when you compare the end communication to the beginning communication. The lives of patients depend on accurate and timely communication. In reality, some radiologists are not waiting for permission. After I was refused the opportunity to speak with the rating radiologist, I went to Twitter and complained. Immediately, Dr. Zaidi tweeted me and offered to help me both in understanding my radiology report and in actually reading the imaging study. Even without Twitter, the reality is that you do talk to patients. One, through guidelines like the ACR appropriateness criteria for imaging exam selection, 
and two, through the report you write for every imaging study you read. Increasingly, these are available to patients through patient portals. Unfortunately, the patient doesn't know about appropriateness criteria, and they don't understand what you write in your reports. Today, most patients rely on the referring physician to pick the right test and to relay the test results. But what if the referring physician never reads your report? In an unpublished study, one medical hospital found that 13% of radiologist reports were never read by the referring physician. The good news is that soon you will be able to talk to patients through patient-friendly summaries of the appropriateness criteria, through your radiology reports, and even face-to-face. -face. Let's start with the patient-friendly appropriateness criteria summaries. These are 250-word summaries of ACR appropriateness criteria topics that are easily understood by patients and the lay public. They are written by layperson authors, and they are checked for accuracy by appropriateness criteria patient engagement subcommittee co-authors. These are meant to improve communication between patients, referring physicians, and reading radiologists. They are published online in the Journal of the American College of Radiology. Let me tell you how I found out about ACs. As a layperson, I was not aware of these at all. I basically depended on my physician to pick, to pick the right test. As a patient advocate, I do Google the test and the potential result, but often miss key points. I became aware of the ACs through my role as an associate editor for the Journal of the American College of Radiology. In September 2016, just as I was struggling with the diagnosis for my limp and my hip and back pain, I read the AC for low back pain in my print issue of JACR. It made me aware that contrary to my expectation, an MRI was not the appropriate imaging test for low back pain without concerning etiology or symptoms. It occurred to me that it may be impactful for patients to have this information. It might avoid unnecessary MRIs that are ordered at patient insistence due to lack of knowledge. It would also provide a quick reference for ordering physicians. I approached my editor, Bruce Hillman, about my idea. He was a little bit skeptical, but he said, why don't you give me an example of what you envision? So I wrote a short summary of the low back pain uh, AC, and I sent it to Bruce. Bruce liked it, and he put it on the agenda for our annual strategy meeting of the JACR editorial board. The editorial board also liked the idea, and we approached the ACR Appropriateness Criteria Committee. They embraced the idea, and they actually created a patient engagement subcommittee to implement the process and to oversee the content of the patient-friendly summaries. We now have nine published abstracts with many more in process. Let's talk about a second way we can communicate to patients. Even more impactful than information on the right test for patients are your radiology reports. To you, they may just be technical words that describe the imaging study. To the patients, they can have a huge impact on their lives. Your words and the images can mean a diagnosis, sometimes a life-threatening diagnosis or a response to treatment. In September 2011, my late husband, Dan, started experiencing a pain in his right side. There's no apparent reason for the pain. Eventually, I was able to convince him to talk to his doctor, and the doctor said, well, it's probably your gallbladder. Let me order an ultrasound. But he also said, just to rule out a cracked rib, let's get an x-ray. Two hours later, we got the phone call you never want to get. It turned out that Dan had stage four lung cancer. Over the next 18 months, our lives revolved around imaging studies, CT scans, PET scans, MRIs, and so on. I awaited each exam and report with bated breath. I finally figured out that I could get a copy of the images on a CD and look at them in my, on my computer. I got a copy of the radiologist report the minute it was available. And I spent countless hours Googling technical medical terms and watching YouTube videos on how to find and measure lesions and calculate rhesus criteria dimensions. This was important because it allowed us to get a head start on Dan's results. 
And as his disease progressed, it allowed us to better be prepared for what his next treatment options were and to pick the next step. Unfortunately, I didn't always get things right. I'm not a, radi a radiologist. And it often created anxiety and confusion and sometimes delayed treatment. Imagine if I would have had a patient-friendly summary with clear next steps in my radiology report. Imagine if I could have talked to the radiologist. This would have caused us less stress, it would have made things easier, and it might also have accelerated treatment. Nothing is stopping us from providing patient-friendly reports or radiology consults. Remember the line from the movie, build it and they will come? That's what we have to do. I have told you about just two challenging times in my life when I wish I could have talked to a radiologist. Just 10 minutes would have made a big difference. Can you make 10 minutes to talk to a patient once or twice a week? Some of you already talk to patients, for example, the mammographers and the interventional radiologists in the room. However, a large percentage of you do not. The Economics Committee of the Patient and Family Center Care Commission has taken up the challenge of demonstrating and defining the value of patient consults. The committee is working toward development of patient-friendly quality metrics that can be used in current value-based systems such as MIPS, and they're developing quality metrics for use in future advanced payment care models. How about adding a patient-friendly summary to your radiology report? Arun Krishnaraj has already piloted these at the University of Virginia. Let's work to develop patient-friendly summaries as templates to include as part of your workflow. Having patients understand their reports will result in better outcomes and could accelerate their diagnosis and their treatment. I would like to challenge all of you to go back to your practice and find a way to talk to your patients. Check out the layperson AC abstracts and use them to explain the reason for the test to a patient. Think about ways to make your radiology report more understandable to patients. Help create common templates for, report, for common reports and, uh, and studies, and share them with the radiology community to create a library of templates. Working together, we can make sure that patients understand their health conditions and become equal partners in their care. Thank you. Wow, what a story, a story from one of us. The rest of the afternoon, because we're talking and we're living on this island of innovation, that's gonna be our focus. Let's take the topics we talked about in part one and let's take it to the next level. There was no better person in this room to provide the first comments in that regard. I've already told you her accomplishments and I'm welcoming her back to the stage, Geraldine McGinty. <laughs> The ACR is the voice of radiology. That's our tagline. The ACR is the unified voice of more than 30,000 radiologists, radiation oncologists, and medical physicists. With that voice, we have power and we have influence. How will we use that power and influence to meet the needs of our patients? Andrea, thank you for sharing your story with us. Frankly, some of it was difficult to hear. The idea that, as well-trained as we are, providing exquisite anatomic characterizations of normal and abnormal anatomy, making the diagnosis, the idea that with all of that, we might still not be meeting the needs of our patients, that we might be perceived as distant, inaccessible, it feeds into that stereotype of the invisible radiologist that we've worked so hard to get away from with Imaging 3.0, that culture change that we've struggled to move past, the informatics tools that we've developed, and the work that the Economics Commission has done on aligning incentives. To Andrea, we hear you, 
as difficult as it might be. And we thank you for your leadership and bringing the patient voice to our meeting. To all of us in the auditorium, let's challenge ourselves to think about how we can move forward as a specialty to meet the needs of our patients, whatever they may be. I think our fundamentals are strong. You heard me say that I graduated medical school 30 years ago. And in medical school, we learned about the connection between structure and functions. So at the college, our anatomy, if you will, is our commissions. That's where our volunteers and staff convene to do the work. But our physiology, how you know how we work, is contained in our strategic plan, because that really tells you what we think is important. It tells you where we're going to put our effort. So they are aligned. We have a strong economics commission, but we also have a patient and family-centered care commission. And you heard Andrea tell you that we have, critically, a committee that bridges those two, that seeks to meet our strategic goals of putting radiologists at the forefront of value-based delivery of care models for imaging that put our patients in the center and align us around them. And innovation is in our DNA. We have a strong record as change agents. We are conveners. In 1993, it was the ACR, in collaboration with the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, who pulled together all of the stakeholders and said, this Tower of Babel of different technical specifications and languages across technologies has got to stop and pull together to create the technical language that is DICOM. We are innovators in holding ourselves to stringent quality standards. In the late 1970s, 30% of mammograms were technically suboptimal. It was the ACR that created a voluntary accreditation program that led eventually to the Mammography Quality Standards Act that regulates mammography to this day. It was our community that developed the BIRADS lexicon that has allowed us to have metric-driven practice in breast imaging. And we are not afraid of disruption. Faced with the overwhelming drumbeat of our imminent obsolescence, including at this conference a couple of years ago, about the fact that machine learning and artificial intelligence are going to render us a thing of the past, we have seized the moment and we have staked a leadership position in the safe and appropriate use of artificial intelligence and machine learning for the benefit of our patients. I loved Keith Dreyer's quote yesterday, let's take this thing and run it. So if we have DNA, a DNA that's about innovation and we're not afraid of change, why are we not more actively aligning around workflows and tools that could put our patients in the center? The barriers are real. Even in a post-macro world with a focus on value-based reimbursements, the incentives to deliver more patient-centered imaging care at this, at this time remain small and the hurdles and the barriers towards gaining those incentives are, are high. Too many insurance companies regard radiology as a commodity. Too many health systems and other entities that employ radiologists regard us as, to be frank, high-priced factory workers who just should churn out as many RVUs as possible. And even in our own community, there are people who don't necessarily feel that this is the way we should go with our practice. Uh, somebody on Engage recently said that they were tired of having Imaging 3.0 3 shoved down their throat. <laughs> so I get it. We have to make the business case for why patient-centered imaging care is better care. And we have to tell compelling stories to drive change. But we don't have to dig too deep for those stories. It's the story of our breast imagers who, as Andrea said, have been talking to their patients for many, many years. That story that enabled our RUC team to drive higher reimbursement for diagnostic mammography that in turn will drive better access to life-saving mammography screening. It is the use of clinical decision support to drive appropriate imaging and increase value and decrease inappropriate imaging. It is the use of appropriate management of incidental findings that will make radiologists more effective. 
and it is the marriage of the human radiologists with their machine learning tools to amplify what we do, to see better so that we can see our patients in a different way. And it's also, I think, about being honest about our need to have balance and joy in our practice so that we can make time and space for our patients. Challenges will continue, and some of them we don't even know yet. But I think if we can hew to our basic DNA and some fundamental principles, we'll be successful. That we can keep our practice based on science and free of bias. That we can commit to providing our patients affordable access to safe and high quality imaging. And that we can advocate as a community fiercely for the kind of practice conditions that will enable us to provide our very best to our patients. So, We've talked about the future. A number of us have talked about the future. So I'd like you to think perhaps about what your day looks like in, in the future, where our patients are at the center of what we do, and where we're enabled by our practice tools to give them that kind of care. So you're going to work in your driverless car, hopefully one with GPS. You're meditating. You're setting your intention for the day ahead. When you get into the office, your PAC system recognizes you with the blink of an eye, and your artificial intelligence tool has prioritized some cases for your review. You generate a report based on um, you know, using that tool and your unique expertise as a human radiologist, and the work that you do generates reports, as Andrea said, in the format that's meaningful to your referring physician, that's meaningful to your patient, that enables research, and that also enables the kind of billing and compliance that is necessary to, to pay for your services. Later that morning, you're having a multidisciplinary virtual case conference with a patient called Alice. And Alice is a 31-year-old African-American woman. She's having her personalized risk assessment, as the ACR has now recommended. You're working with your family practice colleagues, your genomics colleagues, pulling together all of her data across all of the health systems that she's interacted with to find her or to create for her a personalized plan of care. Later on that day, you happen to check your Bitcoin account. <laughs> and you've been paid because you've, in terms of the expansive view that we have of what artificial intelligence can do, all of that billing and compliance has happened on the back end. And you've been paid, and you know you're going to get paid, because when your group negotiated your agreement, you made sure to build in metrics for the kind of collaborative work that you've done, and most importantly, for the engagement that your patients have in their care. A utopian fantasy? Perhaps. Certainly don't know what's going to happen with Bitcoin. But I can tell you that if we are going to shape practice, to, be, to enable the kind of patient-centered care that I talked to you about, it is going to be with our unified voice as the American College of Radiology. We are well positioned, as Zeke said, to bridge our islands of influence. We have a voice. We have influence. Let's use that power for good on behalf of our patients. Thank you. So I think what I might have just heard in the first talk was a bit of a challenge, a positive one. And I think what I heard in the second talk was I think we can accept that challenge. And I think we can accept that challenge within the systems that we talked about in part one. But if we're going to accomplish that, we need tools. We need tools to enable that challenge, to enable our response. I've already introduced them in part one. I'm going to bring them back to the stage to talk about this topic. Matt Hawkins. I realized that first talk, I probably made the cameraman's job really hard. Do you want me to stay a little closer to center? Uh, okay, so my goal today in part two is not only to talk about tools that we need, particularly focusing on quality improvement in informatics, I'm going to challenge the way we invest to build our teams uh, in healthcare and give you a little bit of background and my perspective on that. So let's see if we can get the old clicker to work here. How are we doing back there? There we go, that's it. Okay, so how often have you heard somebody saying in healthcare, 
why is it that I have to fill out a form every time I go to a doctor's office when I can go on Amazon and they tell me all the things that I want to buy? Or why is it when I want to schedule an imaging exam, I have to actually make a phone call rather than go online and do all this when I can go on Amazon, Amazon and do X, Y, or Z? Okay, how often have you heard that? How often have you caught yourself saying that? Right? Well, I'm going to give you 22 billion reasons why. Okay? Last year, Amazon, $131 billion net asset company, spent $22 billion to improve their operations. That's not R&D funding. I'm talking about improve their operations. Invest in their team, invest in Amazon Web Services, and improve everything that they do top to bottom to make your experience as a customer as seamless as we all describe. Nearly one-sixth of their budget spent on improving the way that they run their business. So, until we spend one-sixth of our operating revenue on improving the way we do business, please never catch yourself saying these things again, okay? Okay, healthcare is an incredibly complex operation. We have to understand some of the limitations of operating in a complex system, right? If you were working here on this phone cord and you, a phone call actually didn't get connected to where it was supposed to get connected to, would you blame the person or blame the system? And when you operate in a complex system, there are two core tenets that we absolutely have to accept. Two core tenets that you have to accept and understand. Number one, individual behavior does not predict system behavior. Turns out most people want to do good, believe it or not. And well-intentioned people sometimes make mistakes. Number two, effects are unpredictable. They're hidden, removed from actions. Sometimes when mistakes happen, it's very, very difficult to figure out what went wrong. You've heard of the Swiss cheese theory. And that's why if you want to take quality improvement seriously, I'm going to talk about quality improvement first, we have to ingrain that into the fabric of our organizations, which is not necessarily the way we do it now. How do we do it now in healthcare? All right? When there's problems, what do we tend to do at it? Throw more resources, right? Hire somebody. Add another vice president. <laughs> what does that do? Raises our costs. We tend to go after individual problems. My favorite example of this, and if you want to see an outstanding dose of hilarity, watch a hospital chase clapses, right? Central line associated bloodstream infections. Have you seen how many random out of nowhere interventions they have attempted to decrease clapses, right? First, you have to change the dressing every 24 hours. Then that was too much. They tried it every 48 hours. Then they made people get in sterile gowns to do the central line dressing change. And despite all of their interventions, central line uh, infections are actually increasing in the United States of America because they're chasing individual problems. So when we chase individual problems, that leads to inconsistent outcomes. You know what happens next, right? More forms, tighter micromanagement, more checklists in your EMR, right? before you can actually provide care to patients, which of course leads to frustration and burnout. And if you don't believe me, I will give you this chart. I'll give you a minute. <laughs> this is not from the onion. <laughs> this is real. This is an absolutely real chart. So if you don't believe me, uh, further, this is uh, hot off the press. This was just published in JAMA in March of this year. They took a look at spending in the top 10 most expensive healthcare countries in the world. As you all know, we spend more than twice as much on healthcare than any other country in the world. Okay, and they came up with a really interesting finding. Turns out there are two main drivers of our high healthcare costs. Number one, our drugs are really expensive. Number two, administrative costs. We spend eight times as much on administrative costs in this country than any other country in the world. Okay? So our approach to quality improvement, or perhaps performance improvement, which is the term I prefer, uh, perhaps has gone awry and has become incredibly expensive. So what do most of us do to approach quality improvement? We hire a quality person. How many people out here have a quality person in their department? Yeah. And what do we all do when we hire a quality person? We all go, thank God, now I don't have to worry about that anymore. Okay? And then we get an office for the quality person. 
It's usually down in the basement, but like the sub-basement, right? Down in the back, dark hallway, around the corner, somewhere where you never see. And so then when you've hired a quality person that's down in the sub-basement, they have to start doing work to legitimize their existence. They gotta get paid for a reason, right? And what happens when people have to justify their existence? We start seeing things like this. Fishbone diagrams, spider graphs, run charts, Pareto charts. There is a time and place for this, and it is a sophisticated science, and I want to speak to the, there are quality improvement professionals in this room that I will never be as good at. But we do not need a Pareto chart to figure out if there's enough parking spots in the parking garage for everybody at the hospital. We have over-intellectualized quality improvement in many instances, which turns people away because we have it integrated into the fabric of how our organization operates. What about informatics? I'm not gonna talk about artificial intelligence. What about informatics? I think there's an important distinction we need to understand. Technology, we're considered the technologically advanced specialty. Technology was the linchpin that made us as efficient as what we are. It has allowed us to churn and burn. Informatics, rather, is needed for a different reason. We don't need efficiency anymore. We need to improve quality and reduce waste. To re improve quality and reduce waste, we need data science, not technology. And that's a big difference, and I think an important distinction for this audience to understand. Here's what I call the sophistication to gain table for informatics. I think it's important for us to look at this as we look at how sophisticated we are as it comes to the world of informatics. Sophistication increasing on the y-axis, gain increasing on the x-axis. Okay, let's look at the bottom, standard reports. That tells us what happened. That's about where we are, okay? Maybe ad hoc reporting, how many, how often, where, all retrospective, right? Doing retrospective reviews, looking at how many procedures we did, how many complications we had, what was our successful biopsy rate, okay? Uh, we get up to alerts, what actions are needed, we're just getting there, right? Fortunately, the ACR has a number of tools coming out that are gonna be able to give us alerts to guide uh, clinicians, with, uh, particularly with incidental findings. Now we start getting into the why is this happening? Or perhaps even better, what will happen next? And the ultimate, of course, what's the best that can happen? I'm not sure we'll get there in my lifetime. But you start to realize how not sophisticated we are in the world of informatics and data science as compared to many ind industries. I've already used Amazon, I could use airlines, I could use the financial industry uh, as well. It's because we haven't built our teams the way that we need to do these things. This is the type of team that it takes to do the things that we want to do. Again, look at the bottom, reporting. What, what does it take to do reporting? The lone quality professional, down in the sub-basement. Okay, maybe go do an query, get an application specialist. If you want to build a dashboard, get an analyst. You start getting up to alert, it starts requiring a different type of person, not just a quality person and probably just not a radiology IT person. Right, radiology IT people are only worried about one thing, right, one thing only. Just make sure PAX doesn't go down. <laughs> Beyond that, they've done their job, right? Okay, so now you want to go into analysis and start figuring out how you as an organization begin to provide better care. If you really want to start getting scary, if we go into a per capita payment model, which might happen at some point in time in our lives, I don't know, how are we going to come up with that number? How are we going to come up with that number with our existing infrastructure of performance improvement in informatics? And then finally, forecasting requires an entire data community. I love these drawings, so I, like I've already said, like I've already told you, I don't feel like we've built our teams the way that we need to build our teams in order to advance as a specialty. We have another issue. These drawings are my favorite. You see data coming in from all over the place, right? Imaging data, laboratory data, clinical data. It goes into the centralized open data repository and then it goes through the cloud. The cloud. And I don't care how dark and stormy your cloud is, whether it's a cirrus cloud or a cumulus cloud, I don't care. If the data that's going into it is garbage, the information that's gonna come out on the back end is not gonna be anything you can do anything with. Who here read a note in Epic lately and believed anything in it? <laughs> right? Let's be honest with ourselves. Our electronic medical records were built to make sure that we get paid for the work that we, are do, that we do. They've tried now on the back end to make them electronic medical records, but what they really were was a great way to get paid for the work that we do. And the data that's in them, it's hard to do anything with data if the data is garbage. 
right? So that's why when we talk about artificial intelligence, particularly as it pertains to use of clinical data, I'm not so sure we're ready for that because the information that's there is hardly believable. This is a great study out of the University of California, San Francisco, uh, recently just published in JAMA Internal Medicine fall of last year. They looked at all the notes in EPIC. Uh, EPIC was uh, their particular electronic medical record. And actually turns out 50%, it might have been 49, 49 or 50% of all the content in the medical notes was copied and pasted. I don't mean pre-populated, copied and pasted. Okay, copied and pasted. So currently as it stands in healthcare, radiology is not excluded, we have not built systems that produce data that we can actually do reasonable analytics, let alone artificial intelligence, to advance our profession. So how do we get to this point? And what do we need to do moving forward? I think it's important to look at where we've come from in healthcare. Years ago, 40, 50 years ago, this is how we did it, right? Individual provider. The individual provider took care of people, delivered babies, did house calls, did appendectomies, did whatever was needed. Of course, that quickly changed over time. We realized that adding a layer of clinical subspecialty or clinical sciences to our expertise was helpful. Now we had experts in anesthesiology to help with that surgery so it wasn't just whiskey and a wood block, right? Okay? We had general surgeons, we added OBGYNs, pathologists, et cetera, and advanced the, amount of, the type of care that we can provide in healthcare rapidly. I think most of us have advanced to this point and realized there were limitations to that, right? We couldn't all be the lone hero. So building ourselves around other team members improve the care that we provide, whether that's other subspecialty physicians, nurses, pharmacists, nutritionists. I think most people have adopted that. I think a lot of us probably participate in multidisciplinary care, whether that's in tumor boards or things of the like. But if we're gonna take the next step, as Zeke talked about, we have to add a, add a whole another layer of organizational science to that. And that's a whole different group of professionals that we currently don't employ in healthcare systems. And another executive vice president is not gonna help us meet the needs of any of these organizational science objectives. And I think that's very important, particularly as we move to the idea of population health. When we start talking about advanced payment models, again, population health, potential per capita payments, and we're trying to really figure out how we can reasonably build a business model getting paid for the number of lives that we're caring for. Currently, we're relying on claims data. And I hope if there's one thing you took away from my first presentation, claims data ain't always so reliable. So the challenge for us in radiology is not to find new tools. It's to find new teams so that we can do different things with the data that's available and ultimately, it's incumbent upon us to be the ones that are willing to create new sources of data rather than continuing to work with the ones that we're left with right now. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. The next speaker, I've already told you, that she's an expert on alternative payment models. But believe it or not, I actually challenged her in part two to take that discussion even to another level. Let's make the ideas bigger. Let's take the innovation to the next level. Her name is Lauren Golding. I'd like to welcome her back to the stage. Lauren. Thanks, Zeke. Hopefully my slides will not go off on their own course today. OK, so I have three daughters. And they've all played in the illustrious YMCA three to four year old soccer league. This is the middle child. She had the shortest lived soccer career. So this kid would show up to practice. She would go after the ball, knock these little kids over left and right to score goal after goal like it was her job. But then when it was game time, she'd cling to my leg and refuse to go out on the field. Every single game. About halfway through the season, she looks up at me in tears, still with the death grip on my leg, and says, Mommy, I never get to score goals in the games. So I pick her up, and I wipe off her tears, and I try to explain to her that you can't score goals until you get out on the field. So I'd like to tell you that my pep talk worked for Elise. It didn't at all. But I do hope that I can convince you that it's time for us as radiologists to get out on the field when it comes to value-based payment models. 
And I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about what I think is the best way for us to get in the game. So if you missed out on Greg's talk in the first part of this forum, I'll summarize it for you. MIPS is supposed to be painful. And it was really designed as an intermediate stepping stone in the path to more comprehensive risk-based and population-based payments. So the end goal is to get out of MIPS. And the escape route is through alternative payment models. Most of you are familiar with advanced APMs and MIPS APMs. And I talked earlier about why I think it's important for us to define our role in these new models. But there's one big hurdle that I somewhat conveniently left out. We don't fit really well into any of the models that are out there today. The vast majority of them are designed for primary care. There's only a handful of APMs that meet the criteria to be considered advanced APMs, and essentially none of those apply to specialists. Now, the new BPCI advanced might be an exception to that, at least for some of the episodes, but in general, specialists have a lot of work left to do. So I want to introduce you to a third exit strategy for MIPS, and one that I think may end up being the most relevant to radiologists. And that's the Physician Focused Payment Model, or PFPM. So the concept of PFPMs arose as a solution to this problem of specialists not fitting well into traditional APMs. What we really need is a model that allows us to remove some of the barriers to restructuring our care in ways that improve value. Some of those barriers are regulatory. For example, breast imagers not being able to order ultrasounds or biopsies on their patients without going through the referring physician first. Another type of barrier is that there's often no or not enough payment for high value services that ultimately improve healthcare. For example, there's currently no way for us to be reimbursed for taking the time to explain to ordering clinicians and patients on why an imaging test might not be needed. If we're gonna innovate, we need the latitude to reallocate resources and the space to make that transition without going bankrupt. A well-designed APM would allow us to do that, but the reality is that CMS doesn't have the capacity to come up with all of these models, and they don't have the clinical expertise to make them work for all kinds of different specialists. So Congress, through the macro legislation, came up with a way for specialty societies and other stakeholders to propose their own models. And this is how the process works. The proposals are reviewed by a committee called the PFPM Technical Advisory Committee. And for those of you keeping score, that's another acronym within an acronym, like MACRA. And this committee is made up of 11 members. They're physicians and uh, economists and health policy experts. The models are submitted and the presenters come and present them and the PTAC deliberates on them at public meetings that are held quarterly. I've had the privilege of going to almost all of these meetings it's really been fascinating to see how non-radiologists around the country are thinking about improving healthcare, and to hear the PTAC's take on these innovative new models. So the committee will make a recommendation to the HHS secretary on whether or not a model should be implemented. And it's ultimately up to the secretary on whether a model will be implemented through the CMS Innovation Center. The models are evaluated on 10 criteria, and you can see those here. Of the 10, three are considered high priority, and the first of those is scope. So they want a model that's broadly applicable. We've definitely seen models fail because they were too narrow in scope. Like they would only work in a large health system or with a specific proprietary product. So this is important for us to think about when we're considering building a model for radiology because it has to work well in health systems of all sizes and with diverse patient populations. It also has to impact enough Medicare beneficiaries and enough of Medicare's dollars to get their attention. So you might not have a lot of luck with a model for intussusception, but you might with lung cancer screening or breast imaging or incidental findings. So the PTAC began accepting proposals for letters of intent for models in October of 2016. Since then, 25 models have been submitted, mostly from larger health systems and multi-specialty practices. Of those 25, 18 have been evaluated by the PTAC. And so the PTAC will make a recommendation on whether or not to implement a model fully for limited scale testing or not at all. Of those 18, six were recommended for limited scale testing and four for full implementation. Now the real bottleneck here has been with the secretary. Tom Price decided not to implement any of the first three models that were reviewed before his departure. And since then it's really been crickets from the secretary. We haven't heard any final decisions on any of the rest of the models so far. We're waiting to see what Secretary Azar will do with the rest of these models. 
So now that we're up to speed on the process, I want to talk about the building blocks of a PFPM. There's really three core components. As I go through them, I want you to think about how they might apply to radiology. First, you need a care model, one that can improve quality, reduce cost, or preferably do both. Can we do this in radiology? Well, the first step is to find where we add value. What if a breast imager managed the workup of a breast lesion from start to finish? Could we improve quality by incentivizing best practice and improving patient experience? Maybe we could do it at a lower cost by reducing unnecessary visits to a breast surgeon. Could we improve quality and reduce cost by taking ownership of incidental findings? This is where we start, by looking for things that we do every day, but we don't get reimbursed for. And then we figure out how to get reimbursed for them. So the next step is to design a payment methodology, one that incorporates accountability for quality and cost in ways that physicians feel like they can control. And this part gets tricky. Do you want an episodic bundled payment or a shared savings risk model? How are you going to set your target price? Will you use regional or historic benchmarks or both? How will you risk adjust? The problem here is that most physicians' expertise is in delivering care, not designing payment models. In fact, the PTAC wrote a letter to the secretary after the first round of models were reviewed saying just this, that these doctors have really great ideas about improving care, but they're struggling with the details of the payment methodology. So can we do this in radiology? Well, we're incredibly fortunate at the ACR to have economic superstars like Danny Hughes and Rich Duzak and everyone else at the Neiman Health Policy Institute, and they know what all those terms I just said are. And they've been done some really great work modeling out bundles for radiologists, including a breast imaging bundle. So yes, I think we have the resources to do this one too. So you've got your payment methodology and your care model. The third building block is your story. Because in the end, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This is Stanley. Most of you guys don't know him, but everyone who was at the September meeting of the PTAC felt like he was part of their family when the presenters of the hospital at home model told his story. He's a 96-year-old with end-stage renal disease and pneumonia who was able to receive hospital-level care in his home with his family instead of being admitted over and over again for complications of his illness. Stanley is the why for the hospital at home model, which incidentally was the first model to be recommended for full implementation, even though the PTAC had a lot of criticism for their care model and their payment methodology. Stanley was our reminder at that table of why we're all doing this in the first place. So does radiology have a story? Do we have a Stanley? Well, what about the woman with breast cancer who doesn't have to sit and wait in your office while your technologist tries to get the right order for the imaging test she needs? What about the man with the incidental renal lesion that's followed up appropriately and his cancer is diagnosed at an early stage? What about all the many patients that don't get expensive imaging and interventions that they don't need? If we truly believe that the work we do every day adds value, then we need to be ready to tell the stories of when and how we add value to patient care. So I said that PFPMs were created as a way to get more specialists to participate in APMs. So you might think this is a slam dunk for us to get in the game. And in some ways it is simple. You find ways that we add value and see if you can build a payment model out of it. But things are never as straightforward as they seem. Even most of the PFPMs that we've seen so far have been primary care centric. Other than a model managing end-stage renal disease, we really haven't seen any successful specialty models yet. And there's some realities specific to radiology that present challenges when we're thinking about building payment models. So remember that you have to meet a certain threshold of patients or payments coming through your APM in order to be a qualified participant or a QP. Only QPs are fully exempt from MIPS and eligible for the 5% bonus on their Medicare payments. Because radiologists see such a diverse population of patients and clinical conditions, it's really hard for us to achieve QP status with any single model. And there are some costs and outcomes that really are just out of our control. So building a payment model around those and holding us accountable for that doesn't always make sense. One of the biggest roadblocks that we've encountered in this process is that the ACR is a specialty society, not a big health system with the infrastructure needed to implement one of these models just sitting there ready to go. 
so we're theoretically only guessing what your practices can handle. A model is useless unless we have someone willing to take it. So we'd much rather partner with a health system in building one of these models rather than just build it and hope they come. So here's my shameless plug. If any of your practices or health systems are interested in piloting a model with us, come see me. We're going to need your input on this. So maybe the biggest challenge in all of this is an underlying resistance to change. Everyone wants to innovate, but no one wants to change. If we cling tightly to our concept of fee-for-service payments, then we're going to see everything else as a threat to that. Think of it this way. In fee-for-service, we go to the table with the RUC to justify our value in terms of RVUs. In population health and alternative payment models, we have to defend our value not in terms of RVUs and the number of services that we provide, but in terms of our contribution to the efficiency and quality of patient care. PFPMs give us a way to define that contribution and a way to get paid for it. But we have to decide if we're willing to accept some accountability and risk. We can talk about new payment models. We can study other specialty societies' models. We can theorize about all of this stuff all day long in practice. But if we accept that the future of healthcare is population health and alternative payment models, then there's essentially three options. Payer design models, facility design models, or physician design models. This is our chance not just to get in the game, but to make the rules. There are goals to be scored and games to be won. We could be heroes or stars, or at the very least, just part of the team. But in order to do that, we have to be willing to get off the sidelines and get out on the field. And that means finding where we add real value, preparing to take some risk, and being ready to tell our stories. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Watch your step. I'll take that. There's a theme that's been in many of the presentations already today. And it's so obvious that maybe it's not apparent. And therefore, I'm going to state it. It's the importance of relationships. It's the importance of collaboration. It's important, the importance of us working outside of our individual specialty. You've already heard him speak during part one. I'm going to bring him back to the stage to talk about those relationships, how we can improve them. Kurt Schappi. I'm going to give a moment to catch up here on our slides. Uh, so we talked earlier about responsibility and advocacy with respect to money and radiology. And so we did that because within the fee-for-service system, the currency is money. And now that money is that orange dot that was on Dr. Golding's slide earlier. And while we may need to transition away from that, it's somewhat my job to keep that orange dot as big as possible for as long as possible. But there's a reason for that, and that's so we can successfully transition to what's next. And so as a system, fee-for-service is based on relatively simple transactions. But everyone in healthcare wants to move towards value-based systems. So most of us define value as high-quality care with good outcomes and lower costs. And as these value-based systems are constructed, those architectural details are going to be derived from the fee-for-service fundamentals. But the crux of delivering high-value care is trust. So I put to you that the currency in value-based systems is our relationships. When a surgeon seeks you out because you are her radiologist, when a, an administrative team relies on your group's data analytics more than their own, or when a patient moves out of town and she's willing to drive all the way back to see you for her mammography, that is providing value. And it's upon these relationships that those successful value-based systems are going to be built. And so we're going to talk about these relationships from three different perspectives. Our referring physicians, the administrators, and our patients. And how each of those are going to affect our reimbursements. And so I used to tell medical students when they came to interview at our residency program that whether they intended to or not, they were joining a service specialty. And I saw radiologists as a version of that classical doctor's doctor, 
We help other physicians take care of their patients by finding answers to clinical questions in imaging exams. It's simple. And I consider this a useful mental framework for describing the work of a radiologist. And I was wrong. So if we are only generating reports for referring physicians, that is the definition of a commodity. One could suggest a machine might be able to do that. And it's not being the team player that we're going to need in these transitions. And so one of my partners tells newly hired neuroradiologists, when you get a call on your cell from a surgeon at 3 a.m., you'll know you've made it because they need your help. Now, except for my IR colleagues, that anecdote might cause some angst. Now, and it deserves a little bit more attention. The surgeon called your cell phone, not the call pager, not an answering service or the reading room. They called you in the middle of the night. If another physician trusts you so much that they're willing to call you in the middle of the night when they know you're asleep because they and their patient need your help, that is a profound vote of confidence. And you gotta earn that kind of trust. So we're not gonna talk about or belabor the details of what it takes to develop that kind of relationship, but we need to consider what it means for us as physicians, and that's loyalty. More likely than not, that referring physician is gonna send their patients to you and your practice, no matter where you or your group may be working. And so here's an example. This is an excerpt from a letter written by an orthopedic surgeon in response to an RFP that my group received. Talking about service is easy. Providing that type of service is hard. But the expectations on us as a specialty, as radiologists, are only going to increase as other physicians rely on us more and more to help them meet their own performance metrics and to help take care of their increasingly complex patients. Administrators. <laughs> it's easy to caricature hospital or corporate administrators. But if we don't listen to them, and listen like we listen to our referring physicians, we're gonna be in trouble. And everyone likes to say, we provide great service, but what do you do to provide that service? So I wanna give you an example of good customer service probably from a, from a uh, context that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So my wife did part of her training for two years in New York City. So every day she walked from Midtown to the east side uh, to the medical examiner's office just south of NYU. That's eight long blocks in the city. It's a fair bit. And she walked about the same route at about the same time every day. So she tended to frequent the same bagel shop. Now, after several visits, she noticed that her order was getting prepared suspiciously quickly. And so she asked about it. And the owner responded very simply. He's like, well, you come by at about the same time, most days, and you order about the same thing. Coffee, bagel, steel-cut oatmeal, fruit. Think about it. This is New York City. It's famous for being nameless and faceless, for blending into the crowd, and maybe not being the most charming place in the world. But this little bagel shop in Midtown is anticipating my wife's arrival and getting her breakfast ready. That's pretty good customer service. In radiology, we have clients and payers that have needs that we can anticipate, like population health management. The complexities of population-based health are real, and the expectations are not always fair. But it remains incumbent upon us to listen and understand these changing needs of these health systems, or they're gonna find somebody who will. And they're gonna replace you, whether that's with another group or a corporation. And so I've been guilty of this as well, with miscommunication and administrative teams, because as a radiologist, I approach things like turnaround times differently than an administrator. But this gets to the foundation of quality, because we're all going to define it differently. We might believe, as radiologists, that quality is providing an accurate interpretation of a beautiful imaging exam with clear recommendations to the referring physician. 
but the administrator who decides whether your group gets or keeps a contract expects different things. They expect the techs to be comfortable with the radiologist. They expect the patients to have their questions answered by the radiologist, or they should. And they expect the referring physicians to be happy with the radiologist. So the administrators see quality through a different lens. But who is right? Well, for better or worse, we both are. And it's only by working together that we're going to su successfully transition from taking care of patients on the hospital basis to a population basis. And so these relationships with, these, with our referring physicians and our administrators are by their nature complicated. The patient-physician relationship is simple, and it's based almost entirely on trust. Our patients trust us to make the best decisions for each of them as individuals. And in large part, this trust is given implicitly by the title, by having the title, doctor. But we gotta earn the rest of it. And every day, our interventional radiologists and our mammographers earn their patients' trust. And so the rest of us in diagnostic radiology need to move in this direction, and we have room to improve. Because I recommend that you do not underestimate the patient's power to support us, especially as our patients take on a larger proportion of the financial responsibility for their health care. The choices they make regarding what procedures they get and where they get them will take on great importance. And just like we want to earn the confidence of our referring physicians and our administrators, we must expand our outreach to our patients. And this outreach can take many forms, and Andrea and Geraldine discuss some of them here today. But we as physicians have a responsibility to provide accessible health care and radiology services to our patients. And within the realm of healthcare economics, this responsibility is beginning to manifest itself. And one of those ways is the move towards price transparency. This upcoming Texas legislative session, the key issue that's facing the legislation or legislator as far as healthcare is price transparency. So like we influence legislation and regulation, our advocacy needs to encompass these patient-centered goals because we need to be on the same team with our referring physicians, our administrators, and our data science team, and our patients as we take the field, so to say, to engage in value-based care. Because the successes that we have, if we have them, are gonna be built on these relationships and trust. In contrast, fee-for-service is a much simpler transactional relationship, and it requires minimal trust. A contract is signed, a service is performed, a claim is submitted, and a payment is made. That's the core of fee-for-service. As we build new payment models based on achieving value, the successes are gonna require these relationships. To succeed in utilization management, your referring colleagues are gonna have to trust your recommendations for or against an imaging exam. Managing data across an enterprise and using it effectively is gonna require clear communication with your administrative teams, your data science teams, and your hospital systems. And patients are gonna to gravitate towards the physicians and practices that make their healthcare journey the easiest and most comfortable. And if we don't earn the trust of these team members, they are gonna take their loyalties and our reimbursements elsewhere. So I'm gonna leave you with a bit of wisdom from Don Borden. He says the golden rule is wrong. If we treat our patients, our administrators, and our referring physicians how they want to be treated, we just might succeed as we work through the economic challenges ahead. Thank you very much. Let me frame where we are in our presentation this afternoon. I've got one more speaker, Greg Nicola. I'm going to bring him to the stage shortly. Thereafter, Tim Swan is going to come on, and he's going to give some council updates, and he's going to share the election results. Greg Nicola, and I didn't mention this before, and I should have, is the vice chair of our Commission on Economics. But Greg Nicola understands fee-for-service. 
He understands the system that started our discussion today. You've already seen that he is an expert in macro and he's an expert on value-based payment systems. So as we bring this together, as you think about all of the discussions today, Greg's gonna come forward, he's our last speaker, his challenge is to bring us all together, tell us how we can accomplish what I think we collectively agree that we need to accomplish. Greg. So we've exhausted you, right? I'm sure we did. I'm tired. I promised you I was gonna show you how the QPP could work for us. But let's first start and try to summarize some of the things we talked about here. Here's the pile of money we made from fee-for-service last year. Let's just take $10 and look at that. Most of it was made through the volume-based measurement of RBU. But like I said, there's a small fraction that was made through a new measurement, the value-based measurement. Granted, it's fallible, but a small portion of this money is made that way. Let's put this in a different perspective, but let's add in risk where you're financially accountable. In fee-for-service medicine, in this population of patients, you are paid for every service for every single patient that you provide with no financial accountability. But in an accountable value-based system, you're gonna be given a pot of money. You're gonna take care of this patient. At the end of the year, some type of value-based measurement equation is gonna be applied. Whatever money's left is gonna be upward or downward adjustment, and that's gonna be your income. This is a completely radical different way to pay us. It requires a radically different way to think about things. The incentives are different. Do we have the skill sets? Some radiologists will. Some radiologists will do what the QPP is actually asking us to do. That is, to use data to drive care. Some radiologists are not gonna be able to do this. They're gonna be a deer in headlights. They're gonna have a significant road decline. Both those categories, there's not much we can do about. But there's a large category in the middle. They're the radiologists who want to do something. They wanna want do what we've heard all the panelists talk about in the second session. But there's a barrier we keep forgetting to talk about that's a very important business principle. It's called active inertia. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone heard this term? It's a term coined by Donald Saul in the 90s. He's a, manage, a MIT School of Management lecturer, and he used it to describe a phenomenon of when good companies go bad. So let's take a good company that went bad, Firestone. They were a tire manufacturer for seven decades, dominated the auto tire process, and just dominated the market. They had manufacturing processes in place that were efficient and streamlined. They had an executive staff and management team that knew how to course correct and adjust to market stresses. They also had deep relationships inside the auto industry, their clients. How did they go bad? Well, in the 60s, Michelin, another auto tire manufacturer in Europe, came up with a better way to make a tire. It was cheaper, the tire lasted longer, it was safer. Was Firestone a deer in headlights? No, they weren't. They saw it coming. They watched it happen to their business in Europe. And what did they do? They problem solved exactly how they problem solved all the time because they were successful doing it. It just, just wasn't a simple problem. This is revolutionary. They had active inertia. They didn't see it was revolutionary. They weren't able to problem solve outside of the box. That is active inertia and a lot of us suffer from it now. There's a lot of us who don't do all the things that we talked about today. We know it's right, we wanna do it, we have active inertia. So what does a QPP do for us? Well, if you use your billing company and some templates, collect the quality measures, don't really look at them, but you got the high score, put your initials, game over. You have active inertia, but if you use data, find processes that you have in place that really aren't providing high quality care and drive change. Or do what Andrea said, create patient specific reports, patient specific initiatives. How about interviewing your patients and find out what they need from your practice? And you implement that change. QPP is really asking us to do that. 
It's not designed this way, but that's what it's asking us to do. We have to be cost effective. Are we all making sure every study we read is appropriate? And if it's not, are we picking up the phone and just having a friendly conversation? Hey, had this study got through, it was done, but you know, next, next time this is better. Establish those relationships. Kurt talked a little bit about this. Establish the trust. Make sure we're doing things appropriately. Are we all making sure we have a unified mechanism to find and report incidental findings in our practices across the group and being uniform in it? Decrease variability care? I don't see it happening. I see reports all the time that don't have standardized templates or standardized follow-up recommendations. When we recommend a follow-up study, have we done everything we can to prevent that? Have we scoured the charts to make sure that the patient is 105 years old, which technically isn't that difficult, should be on your packs? Have we done everything we can to make sure we need that study, that it's gonna provide value to the patient's care? Look, we can take the easy road in MIPS. We can just collect the measures and be done with it. We can really start thinking radically. We can start using this new data source to drive care in a different way. We heard excellent examples today. We have to take the hard road. We have to start thinking radically. We have to overcome active inertia. That's what we have as a community. This is the first major challenge we're gonna face is payment models. If we learn how to overcome active inertia, we'll be ready for any challenge that is yet to come. Thank you very much. I so appreciate the council's time today. I'm gonna to wrap things up. Do you remember last year when we did our session and I came to the stage and I told you about a gentleman named Mark Gorman. Do you remember that Mark Gorman had pulled me aside during the break and said, wow, I've never heard a group of physicians explain this system as well as your team explained it today. And it was a compliment that was sincere. It was a compliment that I viewed as a challenge. A challenge that we were doing the right thing, we were getting better, but we needed to continue to do so. Before I came up on stage, I asked Andrea a question. I said, how do we do today? And she gave me the most phenomenal comment I could have asked for. She said, I understand it better than I've ever understood it. But I want to tell you about a conversation, and I promise this was not planned, that I asked that I had during the break. A radiologist, and I want to make sure I say his name properly, Atith Hiramov in Baltimore. Atith is a First year radiology resident, Atith is attending this meeting for the first time. And we've already talked about the pressures that the residents are feeling. They're hearing about artificial intelligence, they're hearing about a complicated quality payment program, they're hearing about challenges from the job market and the changing employment space. But he came up to me during the break and said, wow, I want to get involved, I want to be a part of this, I'm excited. This is why I went into the specialty, because this is what I wanted to do. And this is where we are all today. We started our conversation today, and I told you about the Chico Breast Center. I built on what we talked about yesterday. I started the conversation. We went through fee-for-service. We went through value base. We took it to a different level. We had a, one of us, a non-radiologist, but a patient nonetheless, come, us, come up and tell us a compelling story. We looked at some tools to implement that. We talked about relationships. And Greg Nicola just did exactly what I asked him to do. I said, if we're going to go from this island of innovation, and we're going to expand it, and we're going to go to this one, how are we going to accomplish that? And it's every one of us. I made the point earlier, we build bridges in economics, we build bridges in the college. That is a bi-directional bridge, that's a bi-directional mode of transport, and it goes both ways, and it involves every single one of us. Every single one of us in, that room, in this room lives, by definition, on one of those islands. Before I welcome Tim Swan back to the stage, I want to thank the faculty. I want to thank our, I asked them to do a, to do a lot today. I asked them to come up, I asked them to tell us your story, and I asked them to do it with no slides and very, or a few slides and no notes. It's a lot to ask. They made it look easy, they told the story, and I can assure you, there's hours and hours of practice, hours and hours of work that went into the delivery you just saw. I want to thank the economic state. Thank you. thank you.
And I want to thank the economic staff. They used to sit up there. I believe today they're sitting over there. And we come up here as volunteers. We come up and we talk about what we do, and we get a whole lot of visibility. We get a whole lot of credit, and we get a whole lot of fulfillment from what we do, but none of that happens without the staff. I mean, they are as important part of Islands of Innovation as anyone in this room. And for that, I'd like to thank them personally, and I'd like us to thank them as a team. And then lastly, I just want to thank you. I know this council time is prime real estate. I know how important your time is, and I appreciate it extremely much. It's been an absolute pleasure to put this together, and it's been an absolute pleasure to present the team that I presented today. Thank you.